gives me great pleasure to introduce Leanne D'Souza to talk about Indigenous constitutional recognition reform. So please uh, make them welcome, Leanne. Good afternoon, everybody. It was quite an introduction. I don't think it will be all about all about me talking about that, but I've got the great honour and and to um, ask some questions of this fantastic panel that have been very very busy across the festival talking about an incredibly important issue for the the past, um, present, and future of our country. But without um, further ado, I want to throw. He needs no major introduction. Household name. I'd like to welcome Noel Pearson. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this final session on constitutional recognition. I want to say some preliminary remarks before my colleagues speak. We've been pursuing what we call the Radical Centre, an attempt to bring together the Australian cultural and political divide to support a common agenda for Indigenous constitutional reform. I said the other day here at Woodford that the Australian Constitution is very difficult to change because you need a majority of voters in a majority of the states. In other words, you can't win with 51%. You probably can't even win with 60%. The challenge of a majority of voters in a majority of the states is kind of an 80% exercise. 70, 80, 85% of Australia have got to put their hands up for reform. It's not like passing an act of parliament. An act of parliament, you push hard from one side and you try to get 1% or a half a percent over the line. With constitutional change, you can't push it from your side alone. You've got to push it from both sides. You've got to bring both sides of the aisle together. So you may as well start with the aim of trying to get 90% of the country on board. Because somewhere between 60 and 90 is where constitutional reform succeeds. So it's extremely challenging. And the panel here this afternoon really represent that pulling together of the sweet centre, the brilliant centre, the centre where you can get the left and the right yin and yanging together. When you lock in the radical centre, that's what we call the radical centre. In my view, the Radical Centre is not just a kind of split it up the middle. It's not a passive compromise between left and right. You know, the business of just splitting it up in the middle is the usual slack politics. And it won't yield constitutional reform. Cutting it down the middle as some kind of easy bargain won't cut it. The Radical Centre is an extremely intense place. It is bringing together the left and right into a new position, a position of great intensity. But 
it is a sweet spot a sweet spot where you can feel the unity click together my colleagues here today represent those three parts firstly David is from an organization called uphold and recognize a conservative organization that has very prominent monarchist conservatives from the right end of the political spectrum. And David will be able to speak for himself about the organization that he and his colleagues founded called Uphold and Recognize. The organization's title is based on the idea of upholding the Australian Constitution and recognizing Indigenous people. Thomas, his day job, before we set him on the Uluru Statement from the Heart campaign, his day job was with the Mar Maritime Union of Australia. So we can say that he comes from the left side of the aisle. The MUA have been very generous in giving Thomas to us over this past year and they've been supportive of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and Thomas has been at the forefront of the campaign to get Australians to sign up to the Statement from the Heart. So there you have it. A far conservative organisation and a leftist union both occupying common ground. And Shireen, who's worked with me over the last seven years advocating constitutional recognition, um, who came to us as a young lawyer many years ago and is possibly one of the great experts in the law and policy relating to this subject, will speak to the Radical Centre. Because it was she who helped me to plat the two sides together, to find the Radical Centre. So I want, to list, I want you to listen to their various perspectives and have a think about this notion of the Radical Centre. For me, it is the place where you maintain very high ideals. You don't let go of your ideals. You maintain ambition, strong ambition and strong ideals and strong principles. But at the same time, those strong ideals have got to be matched with an intense attention to reality. You've got to get real. You've got to be hard-headed. We're dealing with real politic. So how is it that we combine high idealism and strong hard-headedness about the reality. And if you're able to bring them together in a strong apex, then my view is that you locate the radical center there. If you bring together those two sides in the highest point of tension, then you can locate the radical center. We're still in the throes of this particular challenge indigenous recognition. We're still trying to work out that high intensity. We've found the place, but the tectonic shift in the politics is yet to be secured. I just want to say this one thing. Once we've done this, we have many more challenges to identify the radical center. Because as I said, and this will be my last point this afternoon, as I said two days ago, it's the brilliant centre where the solutions are to be found. Not on the radical left, not on the radical right, but in our ability to fuse a common ground. A common ground of great intensity and brilliance. Where you can get everybody, 80% of the country, 90% of the country signed up 
to something that works for everybody. Let me close with that. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, and reflecting to put this session together, I'm really grateful for the, the support of everybody here. But I wanted to start with you, Thomas, in the middle, speaking of the centre. Um, I'd like to say, you know, that day um, that Malcolm Turnbull rejected the voice to Parliament, can you give us a sense of how you felt that day? We'll talk about the ins and outs and the rest of it, but what was that really? How did it make you feel? It was absolutely devastating. I mean, I knew the amount of work that David and uh, Noel and Shireen had done um, over many years. Um, I knew of uh, commitments made that weren't followed through um, and that became clear in that moment. And uh, it was also devastating because there was so much put into this, um, into this process um, by all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from all around the country. Um, there was so much uh, emotional capital spent in reaching this unique consensus that, um, that gave uh, Malcolm Turnbull the opportunity to take the lead and, and, uh, and, and set us on the course to right some wrongs. And uh, when he threw that out the window, when he flushed it down the toilet, um, it was just complete devastation. Um, at the same time, though, there was um, some clarity you know, he had um, rejected us in the most disrespectful way possible and it set the path um, before us to now go and say, you know, Australians will not cop this sort of treatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in this day and age and we're going to build a people's movement. So it was one of devastation and of hope. Thank you. And what about you, Shireen? You spent seven years working incredibly hard with Noel on, on constitutional reform. How did it feel when you put so much work in and just to have it rejected like that? Oh, so like Thomas, I mean, I was completely devastated, very, very angry. Um, but just the sheer stupidity of Turnbull's decision as well. Um, the fact that he, he could have such a brilliant, as Noel said, radical centre solution handed to him, the Indigenous consensus built by all the hard work of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the country. But at the same time, you know, you, you've got this unprecedented national Indigenous consensus on the other side, Conservatives had been doing the work for the last three years, building the Conservative consensus. So you had this moment in Australian history that had never happened before. All the Indigenous advocacy of the past tended to emanate from different regions and different First Nations petitions and letters to the King and things like that. Never before have we been able to say we know what the national Indigenous majority position is, let alone the fact that those constitutional conservatives, the same ones who have run every single no case in the past against a republic, defeating Malcolm Turnbull, by the way, the same ones who defeated a Bill of Rights against all the progressive human rights lawyers, the same ones who defeated the local government recognition referendum, those same guys on this reform were willing to stand up and say yes, not only say yes, they were advocating the exact same reform that Indigenous people were asking for. So Turnbull was presented with that historic, unprecedented political opportunity, an opportunity to make the radical centre come alive and sort of redeem his failed moral legacy. He could have been the guy that delivered this. And instead, he verbaled the Australian people. He said that they wouldn't support it, even though there was all this evidence to the contrary. You know, they didn't do polling on it. An independent poll indicated that there were similar levels of support as to same-sex marriage. An independent poll showed 61% of Australians would support a voice in the Constitution for Indigenous people. The plebiscite found 61% 
of Australians would support same-sex marriage. So Turnbull's decision was despicable, but it was also stupid. So having said that, Shireen, could you talk us through what were his reasons for the rejection? You talk through what, what were they, why did that, and why you believe they were wrong? Yeah, so he, he put out this press release with his government that was full of lies. You know, the first lie was that a voice in the constitution for Indigenous people would be contrary to principles of equality. That's a complete and utter lie. There is no principle of equality in Australia's constitution. That's exactly the problem that Indigenous people have been trying to fix for so many years. And not only that, Turnbull himself has got an Indigenous advisory body. Is that contrary to principles of equality? Was his slogan to do things with Indigenous people rather than to them contrary to uh, principles of equality? No, it wasn't. It was a lie. The other big lie he told was calling this a third chamber of parliament, as if an external Indigenous advisory body with no power to make legislation or veto legislation, that's not a third chamber of parliament. Australians understand that. So, you know, that was fear-mongering. And, you know, there were, there, but it's an extraordinary press release that really it, it is almost as if the far-right um, institute, the Institute of Public Affairs, the IPA, it is almost like it was written by them. Uh, it is a dog whistle to the far-right. Um, so there are a lot of lies in there and I encourage you to read them and identify them for yourself. Mm, thank you. So speaking of the far right, David. So, <laughs> as the um, head of the organisation, uphold and recognise. You know, you've been working to bring the conservative, conservative side of politics on side. You spoke earlier in one of your other sessions at Woodford about um, why the voice, the, the voice of, to, for recognition, um, is a proposal that conservatives can actually support and should support. So why the hell didn't they? Well. First of all, uh, I understand that there's uh, crates of rotten vegetables to the, to the left and the right of the stage for later on. Um, but Conservatives do support this proposal. A few of the key Conservatives who support this proposal are people like Professor Greg Craven from the Australian Catholic University. Shireen mentioned the kinds of Conservatives that have run the no cases for referendums before. Greg Craven was at the forefront of those. This is someone who up to this point, has resisted constitutional reform, but this is something that he sees as important and as the right and the honourable thing to do. So this is a constitutional expert advocating for these reforms. Other constitutional conservatives would be people like Damien Freeman, who started Uphold and Recognise, or Chris Kenny, through his commentary in The Australian, supports these proposals. The kinds of conservatives who don't support these proposals are your usual characters, Tony Abbott, Oh, wow, Tony Abbott getting a woo at Woodford. That, <laughs> I did not expect that. I'm going to text him and tell him that. Tony Abbott, Keith Winshuttle. Yeah, everyone know Keith Winshuttle? And uh, Corey Bernardi. Oh, he got a boo. How come Tony gets a, gets a woo and Corey doesn't? Did you rewind? Yeah, good, good. <laughs> so you've got conservatives, people who believe in the importance of the Constitution who actually do like the Constitution and want to see it improved and want to see this country come together in an act of national unification to make it a better, more complete Commonwealth than before, and reactionaries who, you know, Shireen mentioned dog whistling, that's all they're interested in. I actually don't think they really care about the Constitution. They're reactionaries, not Conservatives. So I do think Conservatives support this proposal and uh, will continue to advocate for these reforms as long as they're on the table and as long as we can support Indigenous peoples to lead these reforms, we will. Could I... Oh, thank you. Uh, could I just add something to that? You know, Noel mentioned that um, over the past seven years, one of the things that we did in our work was trying to reach out to those Conservatives who were supporting previous proposals and trying to find the radical centre with them. One thing I learnt in that process, because I used to go on these spy missions to, to see what all the far-right organisations were talking about on this issue. And one thing I learned is that not all Conservatives are the same. 
there are plenty of good-hearted, smart, rational conservatives who, when you sit down and talk to them, you can actually have a sensible conversation and find that common ground that Noel was talking about. Then there's these other conservatives who... <laughs> I didn't even mean to make that joke, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, who, you know, it's like they use, try to use conservative philosophies as a kind of smoke screen for their bigotry. Um, they hide behind the genuine, good-hearted constitutional conservatives, but actually they're just bigots. And um, what they're really pushing is the, is the dog whistle. And part of the challenge of our work over the past seven years have been to sort them out, sort out who are the genuine conservatives. And what we found is that the genuine good-hearted conservatives come on board with the voice proposal because it's a genuinely modest and sensible proposal. The ones who aren't, the ones who aren't genuine and who are, who are actually racists, they're the ones who don't because no matter and, you know, no amount of rationalising or logical um, argumentation or discussion can convince them not to be racist. So, David, with your remit, which is to, you know, bring the Conservatives with you with regarding to the voice, how are you going to move forward now? What's next for you? Well, after the uh, rejection, the Prime Minister said that the proposals were lacking detail. So the way in which we're going to support this Indigenous-led process is by helping to provide some of that detail in policy documents for each of the recommendations of the Uluru Statement. If, um, for those of you who haven't yet heard of uh, the Uluru Statement, it's in the tent to our right, to your left. I encourage you to go and read it. It makes recommendations for a, for a few things that we might talk about a little bit, but the proposals being a voice to parliament that Shireen's talked about the Prime Minister rejecting, a declaration of recognition to ignite the imaginations of Australians, um, and a Makarata Commission to oversee truth telling and treaty making. So we're going to assist with developing policy documents to try and put the meat on the bones for these proposals. And we'll hopefully have those policies delivered within the next six months. Mm going off script a little, but how, how are you going to do that at the grassroots of the Conservative, you know, miles and piles at home? Well, how this, does that translate from policy down to, to that? Yeah, that's a good question. This is a, this is a long process. One of the things that the Prime Minister said in the rejection was that this is sort of a new proposal. He implied that this is something that was a bit of a bolt in the dark. This has been a proposal that's been advocated for, for years, and we've been talking about this for years. When did, when did we first start talking about this, Shireen? would be a couple of years ago at least, maybe three, four? Yeah, I mean, our discussions with Conservatives definitely began three years ago, and Indigenous people have been advocating for a voice and self-determination for decades, since, since the 1920s at least, if not well before. Yeah, so this is, in terms of the consultation, consultation with Indigenous peoples happened around the country, as Thomas has pointed out, through the Uluru Statement and through the Regional Dialogues process. Um, in terms of Conservatives, we have a lot of constitutional lawyers who want to help. You know, the New South Wales Law Council has come out in support of this, and the Bar Association as well. And we've got a lot of constitutional lawyers who want to assist with this process. So these proposals have been talked about a lot. The time is really to put the meat on the bones and to start putting to politicians some options for how this government, or a future one, could take these policies forward if they want. And I think that's going to be the really interesting question of 2017. It's how much pressure can you guys put on these politicians to put these proposals on the table in Parliament? How can we galvanise political will to drive these options forward? And the policy documents are basically just the little technical how-to manuals for how we'll do that. Okay. For, for me, um, I've never had faith in the Conservatives, um, but I do have faith in people power. In fact, I've I don't have a lot of faith in most politicians that I've ever known about. Um, but even in the Conservative seats, if um, the voters uh, are strong enough, you know, and, and, and loud enough, then even Conservatives can be forced to come on board. It's only with that sort of push that Conservatives can really come on board, in my view, and that's, that's all of our roles. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the really important thing here. The other part of it is, you know, like with marriage equality, um, conservatives 
almost all of them, if not all of them, at, at one stage never supported this sort of change. But there are young Conservatives that come on and things change. So um, there's two things there. I have not a lot of faith in most politicians, especially Conservatives, but I do have faith in our ability to influence politicians because their interest is in how you're going to vote. Mm. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I probably just want to take a step back for a minute, Thomas. And you know, by, re by the referendum council rejecting the recommendations, they're actually therefore they're rejecting the Uluru statement from the heart. Alongside that, can you just sort of give us an overview of the Uluru process, the dialogues, and, and how you felt at the convention? Yeah. So. Um the Uluru process, the, the, the process that led us to Uluru and um, uh, to endorse the uh, Uluru statement was one that is unprecedented. You know, it was, there were three day dialogues in 13 regions around the country. There was a formula applied where two local conveners, co-conveners and five facilitators applied a formula of trying to invite 60% traditional owners connected to country in that region. 20% Indigenous people from Indigenous organisations in the region and 20% Indigenous people that are active in the community. Um, and there were lessons on, um, you know, the, there was uh, presentations on the history of the struggle, there was, uh, there was presentations about what our constitution is, how it works, where it came from, um, you know, how our parliament works. All of this, they were really informed discussions. There were experts there, you know, constitutional lawyers that were on hand for the entire three days for people like me who had no idea about the constitution at the time to ask questions. You know, what does this mean? Why does it not work like that? Why can't we have this? You know, so these three day discussions also had a very careful record of meeting and the records of meetings were read back to all of the people at those dialogues and endorsed as an accurate record. Um, then when we came together at Uluru, uh, it, was, it was much, you know, because of that process, all of those people that were at Uluru that were elected in the dialogues um, were then really well informed. And when they crafted the Uluru statement and endorsed it, um, I think because of that careful, informed process, that is why this statement is so striking, it's so intelligent, and it is something that we cannot let go of and we must achieve. I, um, I encountered it in Darwin at the art fair that I said to you earlier and I didn't expect to encounter it at that time and it just had such a powerful impact on me as an individual and came home and told that story to my family. Taking it around the country, how, how, what's been the reaction from people from all, from all persuasions and also are there conversations happening at, at, in the tent about the rejection? Oh look, um, it's, it's been a great honour to travel with the Uluru Statement. I, I picked it up in um, Gama and I just saw, you know, I mean, I was a, a part of the whole thing and I'm a signatory to it and I, I knew the words um, and they are really, really powerful in themselves, you know. But when I saw the statement at Gama, just the way that the, um, the artwork of the Mudatjulu woman um, comes out at you, you know, is so striking. You know, the, the signatures of all those people that, um, you know, just, just were... Um, that embraced each other with so much hope at that moment when it was endorsed, um, their signatures all around these powerful, powerful words. I thought this document, this, this piece here, must be seen by Australia. It must get out to the communities. It must be explained, you know, about what, a, what an amazing process that was, this was. Um, I I've, I've took it to, the first place I took it to after Gama was the Gurindji walk-off anniversary. And I sat with the elders there overnight before the reenactment of the walk-off and uh, explained, um, you know, what had happened and what it means and what it could mean to the Gurindji people. And there was absolute support. In fact, a really powerful statement was read out the next day at the, uh, the walk-off anniversary. Um, I went to the Kimberleys after that, a meeting of uh, uh, four AGMs all at once at Lumberdina, a little place up the Cape Levic, um, where, where hundreds of uh, Kimberley people came together um, I did a presentation there, and again, absolute support, unanimous endorsement of the statement. Uh, I went to the Malpra, Malpa people in, in the Pilbara, a Yule River bush meeting, um, 
you know, out at bush. You know, this, this statement has been, you know, I'm supposed to be looking after it, but it's sat in the grass and, you know, on the dirt and all that because it's a working document. Um, the people there, you know, I witnessed uh, at, uh, in the Pilbara, the people coming together for the first time, you know, it really amazed me, but for the first time they started to pull together their own Pilbara advisory voice. And um, I was able to relate it to them that this is, this is I mean, it was just a, a, such a touching experience to be there as they, for the first time, pulled together this collective voice. Um, and they got it. They got that this, this local level um, organising, uniting, um, having a strong voice also needs to be replicated in Canberra where the deci big decisions are made, you know. Um, I went to uh, the North Queensland, Cape York, um, the Torres Strait, um, everywhere I go, you know, I've been to Redfern, um, Canberra, everywhere I go this document, this, this statement uh, is endorsed, it is um, embraced, the words are so powerful, I see people crying all the time when they read it. Um, it has just been a magic experience to travel with it. Um, and it can't just be about this statement though, you know, it, the, the, the physical thing. Um, again, you know, we need people to get the word out about what these words mean, how magic this document is, and how important the, uh, the things that it seeks to achieve are. Mm. Good work. But the never-ending tour, tour life of the Statement of the Heart. Shireen, you wrote a, a fantastic essay, a really powerful essay in the monthly, um, where you quoted Noel Pearson um, saying that the rejection from Malcolm Turnbull is not the end of the battle. So what is the battle plan for 2018 and how can all Australians help? Uh, oh, sorry. So that was a, an essay by Noel, actually. Um, and um, it was a very powerful essay. It was called Betrayal. And uh, this is precisely what it is. And in that essay, Noel tells the story of how he and I met Malcolm Turnbull back in 2015. So when he calls this a new proposal that's come too late, well, we were already talking to him about it in 2015 when he was communications minister, before he was prime minister. And in that meeting, we explained to him the logic of this proposal of an indigenous advisory body in the constitution. And he listened to the logic and he said to us, that sounds sensible. And he even then started discussing with us how he might help to promote it with a pub event in his electorate. Then 2017, he comes out and calls this a third chamber of parliament. So this is a betrayal. That is a lie. You know, uh, it was a sensible proposal back in 2015 and it's a sensible proposal now. As to the plan for this year, that is such a hard question. But I think that, you know, listening to what Thomas was saying there, he's absolutely correct. And I've observed the same thing, that this proposal has an immense capacity to unite Australians. Um, and when you think about just how remarkable what they achieved at Uluru was, that was an Indigenous consensus across cultural and linguistic divides and across urban and remote and regional divides and north-south divides, you know, and ideological political divides. So that in itself was extraordinary. But what we've seen since then, you know, I never thought I'd see the day on Q&A that Kevin Rudd said, I'm on a unity ticket with Alan Jones. <laughs> And their unity ticket was in declaring that Turnbull made the wrong decision in rejecting this and declaring that this is a sensible proposal that deserves to go forward. So I agree with what David and Thomas have said that the government hasn't only betrayed Indigenous people here, they've betrayed all Australians because how insulting to verbal the people in the way that he has. You know, he, he at least, despite all his uh, stuffing it up, he at least in the end 
went with what the Australian people wanted on same-sex marriage. On this issue, he does not even have the respect to do that. And I just was told today that at 12pm, Turnbull made comments in The Australian that he'd like to have another plebiscite, potentially. Not on the Uluru statement. No, that, on that he's outright rejected it and verbal the Australian people and said that you wouldn't support it. He now wants to have a plebiscite, potentially, on the Republic question. So, the injustice of this is just disgusting. And I am kind of at a loss that the immorality of it, the dishonesty of it, and the betrayal of it, the only way we can make him pay, frankly, is to get him out, get him and his government out. Yeah. And the only people that can do that is all of you. Uh, so I don't know what to do now this year. I really don't know what the plan is other than, as Thomas has said, building the people's movement, uh, making them see that they cannot get away with this. There is a political cost to this despicable behaviour and the Australian people will hold them to account. Which, in, I, in light of... Can I just add something to well, that? Yeah. It's, it's also... Turnbull's rejection of the Uluru Statement is not the end of the road by any means, as Shireen has pointed out. It's also useful to point out that every single Prime Minister and opposition leader since Kevin Rudd and... Uh, and um, John Howard, sorry, have supported constitutional recognition in some form or another. So this is by no means the end of the road at all, even for this government. So how long do you think it's going to take? As long as it takes. As long as it takes. What I mean, about you, Thomas? As long as it takes that there's that much pressure from you guys that they have to implement it. That's how long it'll take. Mm. Do you want to take questions? Or? Yeah. yeah. You got that mic? Still I think that the panellists that sort of we wanted to get to, but there is an opportunity to ask a question of the panel if anyone has um, the mics here. I just don't put... Yeah. Cool. And I saw a hand go up over there, blue t-shirt. Could you stand up just to help the mic go? No, the mic's coming. Wait, wait, wait. And a question, please, not a... Um, Has there been uh, any statement from Bill Shorten or the Labor leadership about the Uluru Statement, whether they would uh, make it policy at the next election? The opposition. Did you hear the question OK? Yeah, Bill Shorten has been pretty strong. Um, we don't have uh, an actual election commitment, um, you know, that's not their platform for the election election yet. Um, but again, it's something that um, anybody with the capacity to make a difference there, writing to your local member, if you're a Labor member, moving resolutions at your branch level, um, that type of thing will help. Um, we do need an election commitment, I believe. You know, we need much stronger than, than the, the words so far. We need uh, an election commitment. Thank you. So another question? There's one down here, second row at the front. Sorry, going to make you run in the heat, Brad. Yeah, second row here, singlet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing as how Turnbull's knocked it back, and um, and uh, Turnbull is supposed to be on the progressive side of the Liberal Party, how how are you going to develop policy? Because you know. Uh, I don't know how democratic the policy um, formula, or the the, uh, the formulation of policy is within the Liberal Party. From what I can gather, it's not a very democratic party. So I, I'm just wondering how how you're going to develop policy. You know, like <laughs> it seems like an impossibility. So the the question is how, given the diversity of views in the on the right. Given that diversity, how do you develop policy that's going to wash with them? Is that the substance of the question? So, in the in the Greens, policy decision making is done through the through the branches, basically, um, and workshops. So, in the Liberal Party, if you've got Malcolm, who's a progressive saying, forget it, 
and then you've got the conservative, um, you know, the hardcore right-wing conservatives rejecting it. How are the workshops going to develop any sort of policy if you have workshops? Or I don't, you know, I don't know whether the Liberal Party actually workshop deposit uh, de uh, policy decision making. You know, whether it's just done through some sort of um, uh, elected body that makes the decision. You know, like uh, yeah, so. The yeah, question's no, about what's the, the process. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, no. How is it going to happen? Because both the progressive and the um, conservative side of the Liberal Party are saying no. So how are you going to get any policy out of it? You know? Well, I mean, it's up to this point, the question has been, how do you address the reasonable concerns of conservatives? As Shireen's pointed out, there are, there are rational and irrational concerns, and the concerns regarding the integrity of the Constitution being disturbed by any insertion of an advisory body in whatever capacity, that's a reasonable concern that we've worked through to try and develop. And we've brought on that journey a few parliamentarians who have at some point come in and contributed their views as to how this could work in terms of being something very much from the ground up, as Tim Wilson put it. Um, Shireen, do you want to could, add could to the Could I just also, detail? to make clear, um, you've got to make a distinction between policies that the political parties make um, and uh -huh. policies that independent policy organisations like Cape York Institute or uphold and recognise might make. So when Noel and I work on a policy for Cape York Institute, um, we don't have to go and, um, you know, work on that with the Liberal Party. It might be good for us to consult with them and keep trying to bring them on board, as we did, um, and same with uphold and recognise. So it's, it's, you know, just to draw that distinction between the policy that the Liberal Party make and the policy that external policy organisations make to then try and influence the policies of political parties. But can I just say something about, you know, you're right. Turnbull was supposed to be a more progressive prime minister and he's disappointed everybody in that regard. But let me just say, particularly for this very progressive audience, there has been this strange sort of phenomena in the constitutional recognition discussion where sometimes the more conservative people are actually willing to be a bit more ambitious than the progressives. And it sounds funny and topsy-turvy, and I was confused when it started happening as well. But, you know, Noel uses the phrase of the soft bigotry of low expectations. <laughs> I was doing a talk in Melbourne, uh, and I wanted to discuss the, the treaty topic and the constitutional recognition topic, and I came across these two good-willed white progressive lawyers, and they did what what, what many good-willed white progressive lawyers tend to do, which was they fell into the trap of the soft bigotry of low expectations. Frank, Father Frank Brennan, who is a human rights advocate, is, is very guilty of this. He has advocated for minimalism, symbolism, that, constitute, that, that Indigenous people did not want. You know, yet he's a human rights advocate. He calls himself an Indigenous advocate. And there are a few human rights lawyers like him. And this same strange phenomena also can happen in the Liberal Party, where you've got people like Malcolm Turnbull, who you would expect to be ambitious, and hey, in 2015, he was positive about the proposal. But as it turns out, someone like Julian Lisa, uh, who is a constitutional conservative, and who is a monarchist, who opposed a republic and opposed a Bill of Rights, on this issue, he's willing to be more sensible. So uh, you can't always say that the left automatically support strong reforms. And one criticism I've had of progressives throughout these seven years is that they've often been kind of missing in action when it comes to standing up uh, for, for what Indigenous people are asking for on this reform. And I, I think that, that the outcome has suffered a bit from that as well. So, so there is responsibility on all sides here. And I, I call on you as progressives to not be missing in action any longer. There is no longer any perceived dichotomy that people can point to and say, oh, I don't support constitutional recognition, I support a treaty. So that's why I'm not speaking up in defence of... No, you can't do that anymore because the Uluru Statement said we want both. 
<laughs> it said we want a constitutional voice. We want substantive constitutional recognition through a voice. And we want a treaty. So for too long, I think too many goodwilled progressives have either been getting sucked into the soft bigotry of low expectations and saying, oh, it's all too hard, just settle for minimalism, Indigenous people, which was wrong, or they've been withholding their advocacy and their influence because they've decided they're in the treaty camp as well. Well, that was wrong too. And, and the time has come for the left and the right to step up and make this happen. Work to do. Do you have another question down the middle aisle, Brad Lady in the purple? We've probably got time for two more and then some closing. So we've got uphold and recognise, that's fantastic. You want to put flesh on the bones. Um, but I'm just wondering for a non-Indigenous person who's not in the loop, what's the platform for us to have our voices heard to give you support? So, while we're doing policy work, I think Thomas is probably in the best position to take that question on the, by virtue of the people's movement that he's developing. Yeah, so it's a grassroots movement right now. We don't have a lot of money. Um, you know, the government certainly isn't bankrolling a campaign to try and convince you guys and the rest of Australia. Um, what we have, um, if you haven't visited the tent yet, there's a website, uh, www.number1voiceuluru.org. Um, we need people to register on there. We're developing packages. Because we're doing this grassroots, we need people in all the different communities of the country um, to volunteer uh, to, to help us spread the message, to pull together little actions, whether that be going and knocking on the door of your local member, um, you know, uh, sending a, a petition um, to, to the Prime Minister, whatever it is, you know, um, covering uh, the local Conservative member's office in... Um, indigenous colours, you know, things like that, you know, much like, much like marriage equality started, you know, the, the, the campaign had to start from people in all the different communities doing their thing, building it up until there was such a movement that they could not ignore it anymore. Um, so please uh, get onto that website. There's also a petition, www.supportfirstnations, um, uh, that's been started by Fiona Stanley. Um, all of those types of things all add up sharing your picture with a statement, you know, you've got the opportunity, uh, get your photo with a statement, it's the original that's right there. Um, we'll just build it up and build it up until we, we are successful. Thank you. Is there a hashtag? <laughs> yes, hashtag Uluru statement. And in fact, um, because it's New Year's Day, um, can I ask you all to hashtag uh, push number four Uluru statement and just say that it's your New Year's resolution to support the Uluru statement campaign. Cool. Thank you. Question over here on the edge. Hello. Uh, thank you. I want to talk to the point that the woman just suggested. And, but before I do that, I really want to thank you all for what you're doing. You're doing it for all of us. As a white woman, I've been really feeling so much grief and disempowerment over the last seven years, wondering what to do. So what you've done is you're going to harness all of us that have been sort of floundering around, not knowing what to do. So this is fantastic and I'm feeling so hopeful that we can really pull. And I'm not alone, there's lots of us, you know, just looking for some direction. So thank you for giving that to us. Um, so after Thomas, I was really lucky to see Thomas speak yesterday. I felt really inspired by that. And already I've talked to people from where I'm in Bundjalung country, I went and took photos of the Indigenous representatives that signed. I'm going to go find them when I go back to where I'm from. I've already found people I know. I'm going to set up a regional advisory committee with those, elder, with those people, find other people with me, and, and then we can feed into what you're doing. So I'd like to call on other non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people here to go and set up a regional advisory committee where they're from and start moving towards to back you and what you're doing. Thank you. We've we got two mics going or one? Because right, maybe down the front row here. Yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I just wondered, talking about like mobilising the Australians, because uh, like, I'm from Sydney and I didn't really know that all this was going on and I'm and, and involved in a lot of other kind of social justice movements. Um, and I wondered if you thought about, like, GetUp had a really big 
presence in um, marriage equality and also like all the refugee stuff and they seem to be you know big enough and influential enough to educate and mobilize people and influence um, politics and I wondered if you thought of like joining forces with um, other organizations who yeah, do this for a living Thank essentially yes uh, certainly it's on our agenda um, all organizations I mean we've even got right-wing organizations so absolutely you know I mean get up is um, just an amazing uh, organisation that does really, um, you know, get the message out. So we do need to approach them as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, orange shirt. Maybe you just stand up so that one of the mic guys can see you. And ladies, thank you. That's all. Up. Flip it up. Back up mic, here we go, swapping mics. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Abe and I'm a friend of Uncle Boydie Turner, who's the grandson of Uncle William Cooper. And several of you, he's, he's 90 years old, he's a Yorta Yorta elder, lives in Marubna, and has spent the last few years traveling around the country and, and even overseas, trying to finish some of his grandfather's unfinished business. One of the things he's done to achieve that has been talking about the process that you've you all been talking about. And the shirt that he wears proudly with his grandfather's picture on it has just been reprinted with the reference to the Uluru statement from the heart going around the back. He's a 90-year-old Yorta Yorta elder. He spends most of his time with white fella audiences. And the point I want to make, which has been picked up by the, the last two or three questions, I'm... I'm sad to say, having done a lot of that travel with Uncle Boydie, that there, I don't believe that there's a lot of popular imagination and interest in the broad white fella community outside of the progressive voices that we're speaking to who are very much already the converted in this room. And the Get Up campaigns and other things will achieve a whole lot. But maybe what we really need to do, as well as the regional advisory bodies and as well as the get-ups and the conservative sizes, every single person in this room, if they did make their New Year resolution, something more specific, like go to your neighbour. Don't wait for the colours to be the outside of the MP's office. That will still only reach a certain tiny segment of people who watch Q&A and Channel 2. That, that's not the people that read the Daily Tally and the Herald Sun in Melbourne. We've got to reach out to the masses. So if we all go, if we've got a kid at school, go to the school and get the teacher talking about it with the kids. If we've got a crash, we've got a neighbour, we can just have a barbecue and yarn about a really, really popular grassroots stuff. Because the education about all this stuff is just, I don't believe it's there. We need to reimagine this whole campaign so that the marriage equality outcome that happened, people were saying love is love. They've got to look at the... They don't even have any idea, I would say, most white fellas that I meet with, that there was a war in Australia known as the, you know, the, the, the war when the first frontiers were challenged. Nobody would even conceptualise that. Most people would say, ah, they got their apology from Kevin Rudd in 2008. Isn't that enough? What are we going to do to say no to that? Can you all make a commitment, and I will now publicly, go to your school, go to your workplace, do it at the water cooler, do it at the creche, let there be fundraising days and get the support into what Thomas is doing. Because if we don't create a really strong, energised, popular movement, all the political goodwill won't reach anywhere because Thanks. those pollies that we do win over won't think that the community is behind them. Go for it as a New Year resolution. Thank Good you. Thanks, Abe. I'm going to pull up the questions. Thank you. Could, could I Some add to that? Yep. So the petition that Thomas mentioned uh, that Fio Professor Fiona Stanley started, it's supportfirstnations.com.au and it's gathering thousands and thousands of signatures and you can put your organisation signature up there and your individual signature and get, you know, send it to everybody you know. Um, because that, those kinds of things are things that you can do today. Thank you. So, in closing, is anyone would like a closing remark, reflection, another call to action? Because we're almost out of time. Yeah, I just, I actually just want to stand up for the right on this. I 
With respect, Thomas, I think you didn't do you didn't do as justice. There are a lot of people on the right who support these proposals. Jeff Kennett writing in the telly in support of this. Um, you've got people like Major General Michael Jeffrey, an ex-Governor General of this country, Air Chief Marshal, Air Chief Marshal Sir Angus Houston, Brendan Nelson. These are not pinkos. These are not lefties. These are serious, big-time right-wing white fellas who support these proposals. And there are a lot of organisations who support this as well. In government, the problem at the moment is not that we don't have support. We've had a lot of conversations, especially with the junior backbenchers and with a few of the more prominent um, members of the Liberal Party. I mentioned Tim Wilson, he's one of them. Julian Lisa, um, who Shireen mentioned ran the Republic, the anti-Republic campaign. He's no less silly for that. Um, and despite the fact that you might not like these people, they support this, and that is where the radical centre is on this proposal. The problem, the inhibition on this, is Turnbull tightening the screws from the cabinet level down. If he sees that the support building around him, uh, rather against him for these proposals, that's what's going to really tip the proposal at the moment. It's not that the right are blocking this. We're not. We are there with Indigenous people. Thomas? Well, I'll, I'll agree with you, David. You know, um, this is about people's lives. You know, this is about a, uh, a huge gap between the life expectancy of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and the rest of Australia. Um, this is about um, a global incarceration, you know, an incarceration rate that is an absolute global disgrace. Um, it is not about left or right, I will say that. It is about whether or not you are a decent person. We're in agreement. So, on behalf of myself and many, everybody in this tent and hopefully many, many, many millions of Australians to come, thank you all individually for your commitment, your passion, your intelligence and drive for this. It's so important for our country. Please thank David Atterson, sorry, Thomas Mayer and Shireen Morris. Thank you very much for today. And thank you, Noel Pearson.